Okay, now you know that a shallow foundation like this or like this or even like this can fail in the bearing capacity mode general shear where you have if you have for example a Tarsagian failure type you have something like this, right? where the soil moves up like this so that's called the strength failure and the relevant parameters that you use to extract or to predict this are uh, or predict the, um, the capacities are the strength parameter phi or SU depending on the condition so you use this for drained and this for the undrained condition you're trying to predict failure of this type and therefore uh, you're trying to design against it now there's another way that the foundation can fail um, not really it's not really called a failure it's called um, a lack of of, um, of acceptable performance let's say or unacceptable performance and that's when you have excessive settlement so what may happen is that you may add so much load that the foundation doesn't fail in this form but actually settles into the ground too much so there's no particular bearing capacity failure per se like this okay there's just simply the formation of the soil too much of it that cause, causes the the, uh, the elevation of the foundation base to drop a distance that's called the settlement delta okay so when we design a foundation we, we have designed foundation so far for example like this right we've said okay you know the B has to be well in this case if you recall between 1 and 3.5 meters 3.5 meters produce a, a factor safety that was too high one meter produced a factor of safety that was too low, less than one. Failure, basically. You can't even construct it. So, um, once you design your foundation and you say, okay, you know, my foundation is going to be two meters by two meters, for example, you need to check if the settlement for that foundation and that load will be acceptable. Okay? Now, again, for strength bearing capacity uh, mode of failure, the strength failure types, clearly the relevant parameters are phi for drained and SU for undrained. Their strength parameter or the actual strength itself. For settlement, the relevant parameter is what? Just like for structural engineering, for deformation, you don't care about yield stress of steel, you would care about the modulus of the steel. So and for concrete and timber and everything else. So for soil, we have the modulus E of the soil, S stands for soil. That's the relevant parameter that we use to determine the settlement of a footing. So in your reader, um, you have here a page where it says, bearing capacity is associated with strength, settlement is associated with ES. Okay? And we design footings with characteristics that lead to small settlements. So we want small settlements so that the structure carried by the foundation suffers negligible, negligible damage, right, due to settlement. Um, <clears throat> so because we, because it says, well, it says here, let's just read on, such settlements in soils are considered elastic for practical purposes. So because the settlements that we expect are small, we can assume that the soil is behaving elastically within those small strains. That's why we can use the modulus ES, which is an elastic modulus. Okay, now, we can measure the modulus in the lab and in the field, and there are different ways to do that, but for this class we're going to adopt approximations based on strength. So, the first thing we look at is, uh, is um, this part of the reader right here. These are the approximations. For fine-grained soil, 
the ES is about 300 times SU. So that is a correlation because generally soils that are strong are also stiff. Okay, so there's a proportionality that it's about 300 for fine grain soil. For coarse grain soil, we're going to use an approach that is CPT based. So, ES, the modulus is this parameter B times QT. This is the corrected quantity persistence, so you should write it right here. Well, you already know the one with the T is corrected. And B is not the foundation size, okay? B in this case, where B is, is 2.5 to, to 10 for clean sands, meaning no fines, and 1.5 to 3 for silty or clay sands. So it varies in accordance to the soil that you have, the soil for which you want the ES. In our class, just to keep it, uh, keep the same number for for, for all calculations, we're going to assume a conservative value, which is B equal to 3. Again, this is not B equal to 3 meters by 3 meters. This is this parameter here called also B. Okay? It's also called B. Alright, so if you have a coarse green soil and you want to know the modulus of it, you would do a compenetration test, get the QT of that soil, let's say for that layer, and then get the ES basically by saying that the ES is three times the corrected Conti persistence. What is the unit? KPA. Unit? KPA, right? Modulus and strength have the same units because strength is a stress and modulus is the stress per unit strain. And strain has no units. Okay. Now a typical question is what happens, or a typical situation is, what happens when you don't have QT? Let's say you haven't run, run a, uh, a, a CPT test, a, C, a cone penetration test. What you do is then you say, okay, if I have, remember, coarse grain, right? You may have phi for the soil, right? Indeed, you can get phi much... Um, Basically, in standard practice, is, is, uh, is, it's easy or not difficult to get phi in the lab. So if you have phi for the soil and you want to get ES, and you only have this equation, what you can do is you can back-calculate what QT would be for the soil if you ran a penetration test. So, for example, let's say you have a coarse grain sand with a phi of 40 degrees. And the sand lies... Let's say it's a silty sand, okay? Silty sand, 40 degrees. This is two meters. This is two meters of clay and another two meters of clay. Okay, and the water table, it doesn't really matter, but let's say it's there. So now you want, you know that the fee of this soil is 40, but you want the ES of this soil. Oops. Sorry about this. Okay, let me really quickly go through this again. So, um, you have fee of your soil. This soil is located a distance 2 meters below the ground surface in a layer that is 2 meters thick. It has clay on top and clay on the bottom and rock. Here's your sand, silty sand. It has a phi of 40, and you want to know the ES. But all you have is this equation. Now what you can do is you can use the 17.6 plus 11 log equation. Um, this is QT, and this is square root of 100 times the effective stress, right? You can use this equation to back calculate what the cone would have measured if you actually pushed it through that layer. Make sense? So you know the phi. That's 40. 17.6 plus 11 log. QT is your unknown. 100 times. What is the effective stress? When you use this equation, 
for example, in the homework, the effective stress that you get or you, or you measure, determine, not measure, determine, to put in here is the effective stress in the middle of the layer in question. So what's the effective stress at this point? Sorry. Let's call that point A. Effective stress at A. What is the effective stress at that point? The effective stress is 3 meters of saturated soil minus the, uh, minus, minus the um, excess pore pressure, 3 meters of water. So this is 30 kPa. 60 minus 30 is 30 kPa. So you put it in here. Now, remember this is log base 10, right? Now you can extract QT. That is what the cone would have produced if you pushed it in here. Okay? With this QT, then you can use this equation, multiply by 3, and you get ES. Okay? So, why does this work? It works because there is a correlation between phi and QT. If you have phi, you can get QT, provided that you know where the layer is and the location of the middle point, which leads to the effective stress. If you know QT, you can get phi, and of course you have done that. Okay, so it's there are all all but all of these parameters are related through correlations, and you, so that that means that you can use them, of course, to get one from the other. Okay, so the next page on your reader shows you a method by which we can determine the settlement of a foundation. This is Smertman's method, 1970. Okay, and you calculate the elastic settlement. Now, the first thing to realize is that, well, they're listed here. The first one is that the, the influence zone below the base of a foundation, the influence zone that corresponds to settlement, not bearing capacity, bearing capacity looks like this, and the influence zone is B. Settlement really doesn't look like anything. There's, there's uh, small deformations all throughout the soil mass in here, so all you see is the foundation basically settling into the ground. And that will always happen. Remember that we want that settlement to be less than or equal to the acceptable value, but not more. So settlement doesn't look like anything again, doesn't look like this, that's a foundation bearing capacity failure or strength failure. Settlement is basically homogeneous deformation of the soil in here. So for that situation, the influence zone, meaning the soil that is deforming to produce that settlement, is located 2B below the base for a square foundation. So, in here, if you look at this plot here, we have this, this uh, influence factor, whatever that is, okay, versus depth normalized by the size of the foundation, B. Okay, so if you pay attention to this curve right here, or bilinear curve, let's call it, what you see is essentially the nature of the severity of the deformation, the nature of the severity, or the, the measure of the severity of the deformation under a foundation with depth. So, at the ground surface, at the ground surface, if the foundation is unembedded, let me just uh, put it this way. At the base of the foundation, which is this point right here, the base of the foundation, the severity of the deformation is this much. 2B, 2B below the base, 2B below the base, the severity of the deformation is zero. And below that point, it's also zero. So please only look at this curve. Okay? Now, a distance 0.5b from the base, 0.5b from the base of the foundation, you have the maximum severity of the deformation. And that reduces with depth. 
So what we're saying is that if we have a foundation, I drew it here, but I'm going to draw it over here. If we have a foundation that's B, then we have 2B, right? 2B, and this is 0.5B. If you were to measure the severity of the deformation of the of the part of the soil particles moving relative to each other by let's say in a weird way particles screaming you would have a little bit of screaming of the particles here a lot of screaming in here 0.5 b from the base and then you have less screaming less screaming less deformation less deformation all the way to here at 2 b b b right 0.5 b at 2b you would have very little deformation, very little screaming of the particles and then below that no deformation. So the deformation profile is somewhat like this and as engineers we um, choose to model this curve like two lines. This right here is an approximation of this and this is for L equal to B. What's L? If you look at the foundation from the top, this is L and this is B. So if L and B are the same, then you have a square foundation. So this is for a square foundation. This other curve is for a foundation that is a strip. Okay? Where this is B and this is more than 10B or equal to. So a long strip foundation would have a deeper influence zone in terms of settlement. In fact, that would be 4B below the base. A distance 4B, sorry, a distance 4B below the base. This is the number of Bs below the base because it's normalized. Okay? So we are concentrating in this course on square foundations, so we are going to adopt this approximation. To proceed with the, with the um, process of determining settlement, you need a bunch of parameters. Okay? You need Q. What's Q? This is the load applied plus the weight of the foundation divided by the area. Right? That's the applied stress. You need the effective stress at the depth of embedment. You have seen this one before. So if the foundation is not embedded, like this one, the, fo the, the, de the foundation base is located at a depth equal to zero. So this would be zero for an unembedded foundation. If the foundation is embedded at distance equal to its, um, to its, to its thickness, one third B, then this would be the effective stress at this level. This right here. So it would be one third B, whatever that distance is, right? Times the unit weight of the soil, which is 20, minus the pore pressure, because for settlement and for the bearing capacity, we assume the water table is on the ground surface. Therefore, you would have one third B times 20 minus one third B times 10 as the effective stress at this depth. This right here is the effective stress at the depth where the peak influence factor occurs. So, here's the peak influence factor. It occurs 0.5b below the base. So let me give you... Please, uh, in your reader, make it nicer than... Take nicer notes that I'm taking here. This is a mess, okay? But it's just to show you. So, let's say that this B is one meter, that's one meter, and this is one meter. So you have a two meter influence zone, right, for settlement. Right here is where the peak influence value occurs. At Sorry, this is this is one meter, this is one meter, this is 0.5 meters. 0.5 or half of B. Notice, 0.5. Okay? Half of B, half of B. B is equal to 1. If this were 2, 
this then this value would be one because one is half of two. Okay, so you can rewind that and listen again. Of course, it should be straightforward. These are b's, b's, right? Normalized. 0.5 b, 1 b, 1.5 b, 2 b, etc. So at this level where the peak influence zone occurs, 0.5 b from the base. That's where you need to get the effective stress. So the effective stress here. is the effective stress where the peak influence value or in, uh, yeah, influence factor occurs right there. So in this case it would be what? 0.5 times 20 minus 0.5 times 10 because that's the depth. Remember you always start the depth in this type of procedure your depth begins at the base of the foundation, regardless of where the foundation is. Let me continue with that argument. Let's say your foundation is embedded. If your foundation is embedded, this is B, this is B, of course this is B, right here. That's where the peak influence factor occurs, right? At half of B, 0 0.5. That's your point, in which case this is the amount of soil above it. So let's say this is 7 meters. Your effective stress at the depth where the influence factor occurs is 7 times 20 minus 7 times 10. Okay? The base is what matters base. All right. So once you have this parameter here, of course that's what <clears throat> that those are the three parameters that you need to get this one. Then you can proceed to use the equation <coughs> for determining settlement. Here it is. You have C1, C2, C3 and I will explain that later what these are. They're just parameters that uh, very simple to determine, don't worry. Here's your Q. Again, this same Q here. Same Q. The same Q that you use for bearing capacity. Not Q ultimate, but Q applied, right? Sigma ZD, effective stress at the depth of embedment, is the same one used here. The I epsilon value um, at the peak which you calculated up here, plus 0 0.025 times B, that's the foundation width, okay, over the ES average. Now, what's ES average? Well, here's your foundation. It's embedded in the ground, 7 meters. This is B. The influence zone is 2B, right? That's the influence zone for settlement. So if you have three layers in here, let's say this is 1 meter, let's say this is 3, and let's say this is Oops. One and let's say this is two. In this case, one and one and two is four. This means that your B is two, right? Because you have an influence zone that is two B, which is four, four, right? This is soil one with with ES one, soil two with ES two, and soil three with ES three. Okay, so you calc you have you know that this soil here has this ES, this soil has this ES, and this soil has this ES. Okay, now you can do a weighted average. So the ES average is equal to one meter of ES one plus one meter of ES two. plus 2 meters of ES3 
divided by 4 meters. You have your value and you place it in here. And automatically you will get this in meters. Okay? Now, don't worry because we'll get to this CC, this the C1, C2, and C3. They're very simple to find and um, we'll address them when we do the next example.